Bertrand, in trying to understand what it means to be human, theory of mind is very important. What does that mean? As the human mind that we know and experience, we are intensely interested in other minds, in figuring out what other people are thinking, feeling, why they scream, why they act in a particular way. We are intensely interested in finding out what other people think, what they feel, why they act in a particular way, what the person's reasons were. In fact, we cannot help but attend to those mental states of others. We try to solve conflicts that way. We interpret how other people talk to us, what they mean by what they say. And it's called theory of mind, maybe unfortunately, because it's like a theory, but it's not really a conceptual theory. It is a whole toolbox of abilities that people have from very much the earliest months of life developing into this powerful machinery that allows us to at least often find out what others are thinking and feeling and why they act. And this affects everything that we do. We don't Absolutely. realize how often every interaction we have between people, we're always thinking about what the other person thinks and why they're thinking about what they're doing. So this is how we run our lives, is we all have our internal theory of right. mind. As social beings, we need to do this. Just for me to understand your question, to find out now he wants me to speak, for me to read from your face. Is he now happy with this answer? Is he not happy with this answer? To find out what others are thinking and feeling is a fundamental requirement to be able to respond appropriately to them. You also persuade other people by figuring out what they're thinking now and trying to change their mind. And you express what you're thinking by being intimate. Others want to know, so therefore you offer them your thoughts, your feelings. The silliest sports reporters ask, what was it like to score this goal? Tell me what it felt like. And apparently we are interested in this, but often the athlete doesn't really have much to say. They experienced it, but they don't necessarily uh, can explain to us what that mental state was like. But we are curious about it. Okay, so now we understand the importance of it for really everything that we do in life. How does it develop? We know the story of little children when they want to hide, they put their hands in front of their eyes, thinking that if I can't see you, you can't see me. And that's a developmental, when they get a little older, they, they realize that doesn't work. Right, and this is a, a hard task, to find out that what I see isn't always what others see. What I believe isn't always what others believe. What I know is not the same thing that other people know. This is actually hard and comes probably somewhere in the third or fourth year of life. It starts much earlier, much simpler. Infants of five, six months of age figure out that certain movements are intentional, others are not. Mm. And intentional movements are often directed towards objects, goal objects. And the five to six month old infant can figure out that if I grab or tend to grab a certain object, I want this object. And if you then move the object, then they expect you to grab the object in the new location, not to do the same behavior in the old location. <laughs> Then by the end of the first year, they begin to realize that it's not just intentional movement, but there are things that we attend to with our eyes. Our gaze becomes important. They can begin to understand, if you look at this and I look at this, we both jointly look at this. Then I read from your face. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? Just watch 12-month-olds the way they watch their parents to figure out, am I allowed to do this or not? Is this a nice puppet or is it a bad puppet? Yeah. And then it goes on. Every year there's another new achievement. And by the adulthood stage that we have, we hope we have, we have 15 or so tools by which we can make very simple decisions. Is this intentional or not? And complicated decisions. Did she invite me to this party because <laughs> I'm just part of the department or because she actually wants me to be there? Yeah. Those are the questions that we answer sometimes with very conscious reasoning. But then just deciding whether something is intentional or not, it can be close to unconscious and fast. Well, intentionality is extremely important if we want to figure out how to deal in social settings. Because whether people want things to happen or don't is exceedingly important. Right. So if, if this happens so uh, uh, subconsciously, 
what are some of those tools? You said 15 tools. What are some of them? How, what am I doing when I'm deciding that you, know, you came here because you were happy to be here, not because somebody told you to be here? Right. So the first thing is really it's a perceptual recognition. There are movement patterns. There are physical elements of intentional action that humans are highly sensitive to. You, you don't even have to be thinking in language at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. You don't even notice how often you make that distinction. You go then through joint attention, as I call it. That is, I recognize that you're looking at that, I look at, I'm looking at it too, we are both looking at it. Imitation is another tool. In order to imitate, I have to figure out, well, which part of your behavior is the important one? Mm -hmm. That you hold your arm at this angle or that you grab this object. If I want to learn from you, I have to imitate. Thus, imitation is a core element of, you know, about the, the second year of life to develop that. Then they begin to understand certain fundamental mental concepts like desire, goal, and belief, and that they're very different. Desires and goals help you predict what the person's after. Beliefs help you understand what they see, what they understand, what they assume, and maybe what path they will choose to go after a particular goal. That we have this capacity also of simulating. That is, I have my own thoughts and feelings, but really in order to predict what you're gonna do, I can't just use my own. I have to figure out how yours slightly differ. So what might the person want? What might the person think? Those are the kinds of questions we have to do by deviating from our own thoughts and feelings and simulating another person's thoughts and feelings. Now, this sounds very complicated. It sounds like I have to remember to simulate and to, to imitate and to, and to watch your gaze. But in fact, I, I do none of those things. Right. It's all happening. Very often, at least. But think about the, the case when you were left out by some, per, some person whom you know pretty well. You were left out, mm, there was a dinner party, mm -hmm. and you wonder, well, was I left out because she's mad at me or because she forgot or she sent the wrong email? Now you begin to consciously think about mm -hmm. it, and you, you begin to think back, was there a conflict you had with her? Was there any indication that she really had the wrong email address? Did you change your email address recently? Now the whole conscious ability to mm -hmm. reason through possible worlds, if you will, comes to this task of finding out what she's thinking. But in many other cases, you look quickly, you immediately know. And it's the amazing capacity of the human mind to work with minimal effort with those very con uh, unconscious, automatic, fast tools as long as possible until you hit the wall. Then you have to think, take the perspective, you have to simulate, you have to figure out much more consciously. And we're capable of doing that too. And we are often quite good at doing it. We're sometimes wrong too. But it's this ability to put layer over layer over layer, developmentally and probably also evolutionarily, on the mind that it makes some things very easy and fast, we barely notice, and other things that are difficult, we still have another tool that we can bring to that task. How unique are humans in this versus other mammals? It's a huge debate how unique humans are. There are, if you take this toolbox, let's say 15, there are many animals that have a few of those tools. We know that, for example, chimpanzees are very good at following gaze, and, and they can even follow your gaze even if there's an obstacle. They also can figure out goals. They recognize in your behavior what you're after, this banana or that apple. They have a very difficult time figuring out beliefs, that anybody can believe something that they don't believe, or understanding that they know something that somebody else doesn't know. There's no strong empirical evidence that they have that capacity. So they have a little bit, and they imitate a little bit, but it's interesting that adult chimpanzees don't use the imitation capacities of their children to teach them. So they have small capacity, but it hasn't developed to the same degree that humans have developed it into the machinery of culture that we have, constantly teaching and learning, because we not only imitate, but we have an understanding that others imitate as well. And then there's some other animals, dogs, that have some elements, and, and dolphins have some other elements, but humans are the only ones with the big 15 mm -hmm. toolbox.